We're going to hear from uh, today uh, from Marlon Winger, if I'm getting that correct. Okay. Uh, just a quick introduction on him. He's a state agronomist from the USDA NRCS in Boise, Idaho. Uh, Marlon earned a master's and bachelor's degree at the Utah State University in applied science. He grew up on a family owned dairy farm in Dayton, Idaho where he found his passion for life, which is agriculture. Uh, he worked as a county ag agent for Utah State University Extension Service for nine years in Price, Utah. And he's began working for the USDA NRCS for eight years, currently as a state agronomist for NRCS Idaho. Uh, Marlon lives on a small ranch at Bacuna, where the family raises sheep, hogs, and a few calves and a large herd. Second table, we do have a second speaker, which is Nick Whitman. Um, we had the privilege of hearing from him earlier today already. He's willing to repeat again today. So, uh, I got the wrong piece. But Dick, again, is a founding member of the PMBSA. Um, he is a producer. Uh, he manages a diversified crop, cattle, and timber operation in northern Idaho in a partnership with three other family members. Um, he also provides seminars, private consulting services to farmers, ranchers, agribusinesses, and lenders. He is a founder and past president of the PNDSA. He is a board member of past president of the Farm Financial Standards Council and also serves on the facility or faculty of the executive program for the agriculture producers, which is also known as TPAC. Today, let's see. This session is sponsored by Chuck Miller. Chuck Miller, Spice Day. Um, so, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to If you're wearing a red jacket and fiddling with your cell phone, I need you to come help me. <laughs> <laughs> Personal, oh, sorry. Well, maybe it is personal. <laughs> uh, I need a little help. We're going to do a science fair project here. How many of you seen? How many of you seen the slate or aggregate test before? Mm, not very many. Uh, so, as I've been learning about soil health on my journey, this was something that really, really seemed to help me continue to learn about soil health and uh, and I try to do this at every presentation uh, that I give. I also we also do the infiltration test and how to build an aggregate with styrofoam. But this one's uh, this was pretty exciting. Uh, so we got we got two soils here. They're the same soil, Calthrop so long. They're about a hundred feet from each other and in some different uh, fields from my neighbor. Go ahead and put this one in. Yeah. This one is uh, this one comes out of uh, a low disturbance system. Uh, this one had uh, wheat when we moved in. I, it was into wheat. He no-tilled grain corn into that. After the grain corn harvest, he grazed off the residue with some cattle that winter, and then no-tilled alfalfa into it. Now it's been in for three or so years, and now they're just taking the alfalfa out. Calthrop still on This one, go ahead and put that one in. Same soil type, uh, a little different management or treatment. It's been more conventional till, it's been plowed, it's been disc, it's been subsoil, it's been leveled, it's been pulled packed. Uh, did you break that down? <laughs> so what's going on here? I don't know if you guys in the back can see, but it is disintegrating. This is the same soil type. If you look at the soil survey, these are the exact same soil. I'm, I'm here to tell you though, that doesn't tell us much about the soil health of that soil, does it? So this has just been fascinating to me to kind of watch just in my own backyard from the neighbor's farm. Is it Don? Gosh, I was hoping my talk would last more than 30 seconds today. You're going to probably have the whole hour. Thank you. 
interesting to me how Mother Nature, under some different management, can heal itself. Soil health. The continued capacity of the soil to function. So what I'm saying is this is a functioning soil. If your soil behaves like this, it's probably not a functioning system. So this soil functions as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. A functioning soil should be cycling nutrients. It should have good water infiltration and good water storage. If we had our little infiltration test, now you can see this on the front. There's the soil down there at the bottom. And when that soil dries, it's just going to be about like like this table with very little infiltration rate going on, where a functioning soil has good macro pores, good pore space, that water is going to infiltrate. A functioning soil should be able to filter and buffer. And when a soil starts healing itself and having good aggregate stability, it should be able to have good physical stability and support. <laughs> and also, a functioning soil should have habitat for the microorganisms or to support that biodiversity. So here's, here's four main keys for managing for soil health. Number one, minimize disturbance of the soil. Because the more you the more you disturb that soil, the more you break down that soil aggregate. Massive amounts of tillage completely destroys that and turns it into a sack of flour. Number two, maximize diversity of plants in the rotation. That's a pretty common thing, often seems hard to implement. When I talk to producers around the state, and they're pretty tight on their rotation for one reason or another. A multi-species mix of cover crops can, can help improve that diversity. We've been working with a couple producers that maybe have two crops in their rotation, a small grain and canola. But now they add the 13 species in their cover crop mix as they insert that into their rotation. Now a guy's farming 15 crops in his rotation. So, that's a simple way to start adding more diversity back into a system and trying to make that soil more resilient. Um, one of the aspects with soil health is a little bit beyond sustainable. It's called resilient. A healthy soil is resilient. A healthy soil is restorative. Often in NRCS we talk about our erosion models that say if you, can, if you farm and you erode it five tons to the acre, you're sustainable. Boy, I think that's becoming old technology because we want to try to become restorative, not just continually lose five tons of soil per acre per year. Um, <clears throat> number three, one of the keys to developing a strong aggregate is feeding the microbiology in the soil. And so you want to keep a live root in the soil as much as possible to feed that microbiology community. So what does a plant produce that's feeding those microbiology? It's feeding the photosynthate, it's feeding the sugars, it's being leaked out of the root system. See, in college, I don't think I was ever taught that plants leak pro proteins and amino acids and vitamins and and sugars out of the root system. I always thought, oh, it just goes to the grain. You know, it all translocates up and eventually makes it into that kernel. So why, why would that plant exude these molecules and sugars out of its root systems? To feed the microbiology. Mycorrhizal fungus, which you've heard a little bit about, does not live in a dead in a dead cell, in a dead plant. It only lives in a, in a live plant. <clears throat> Number four, 
keep the soil covered at all times with plant residues. That's the skin. Dr. Rick Haney from ARS in some of his talks talks about that skin of the soil is that residue and it in its many benefits. And number five, we just added in our soil health national team, number five, create the most favorable habitat possible for the soil food web. Uh, if any of you have talked to Jill or uh, heard presentations from like Jill Clapperton, well, she talks about all the little mites that are in there, all the spiders, all those uh, macroinvertebrates. That's habitat that those microorganisms need. Uh, I've got some handouts. I see if you, you guys make the notes, and I forgot to hand these out. Uh, we'll put them at the maybe we can get the passes up. So I don't have this little short exact presentation. Uh, but this is on our NRCS website, this type of presentation and quite a bit of information. So it's on, it's on our website there. Here's an example of growing living roots throughout the year. The benefits, it increases microbial activity and influences the nitrogen mineralization and immobilization. See, the, the microbes are are coating these soil particles with, the, with their active carbon, with their polysaccharides. Mycorrhizal fungus is coating these soils with glomalin. We'll, talk, we'll show you some glomalin. Um, growing a living root throughout the year increases biodiversity and biomass of soil organisms. It improves the physical, chemical, and biological properties. It sequesters and redeposits nutrients and increases organic matter. So just the principle of one of those, the, one of those five principles there. So one of the most important things I think to learn about soil health is that it is a living factory. <coughs> that there's macroscopic and microscopic organisms. And just like a, an elk or a deer or a sage grouse, they need habitat, they need food, they need water, they need shelter. And what is their power source? The sun, which makes simple sugars, we call it photosynthesis. Management activities, which is easily demonstrated in those two flasks there, can either degrade or improve soil, soil health. Tillage never builds aggregate structure. Fertilizers, they're finding out that phosphorus levels over 100 parts per million really reduces uh, mycorrhizal fungus. Pesticides, of course, are quite harming on our microbiology. Grazing is kind of a physical uh, component that can degrade our soils. Uh, and a limited plant diversity or low plant diversity lowers overall soil health. A talk I, a talk I give, uh, another hour talk, is called How Do I Tell If My Soil Is Healthy? And a couple of these slides uh, go through that, but here's five more definitions that we need to get to know as we start digging up our soil. Number one, the detritosphere. The detritosphere is that organic layer of residue that's slowly decomposing, uh, which is important to have in our system. The porous sphere is the pore spaces in the soil. The microorganisms are semi-aquatic. They move around the pores. If your soil looks like a phone book and has no pore space, then you have very limited microbiology diversity because probably only the bacteria at high levels of populations can survive in such a harsh condition with no pore space to move. Pore space is pretty directly related to the gratosphere. The gratosphere is the zone that makes that, those little aggregates. It's kind of like when you look at your soil, it should look like a cottage cheese little container, those little micro aggregates. It shouldn't look like a phone book. Uh, the drillosphere, drillo meaning hole, 
is the zone of earthworm influence. I think we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and also, one of my favorites that I'm learning about is the rhizosphere, the zone of soil right around that root. So if a plant is leaking out pecan pie and caramel ice cream around its root system, where do we think we find the most, the highest concentration of microbial life? Out here three inches in the soil or right around the food buffet? Trick question. Trick question. Yeah, right around the food buffet, right around the rhizosphere, that's where life is occurring in the soil. Oh, so I, I've been watching in my garden. Uh, I've quit killing the garden uh, since we moved there. Uh, it was full of uh, gopher holes, so we did have to kind of smooth it out so we could get the corrugates through it to irrigate it. But man, it's been interesting to watch the earthworms come in this garden. So this is a picture of, of 75 individual earthworms per meter squared. And what they did is dump plaster into the holes with a dye. And in this meter square, there was 70% of the earthworms were anesthetic, or the nightcrawler type and 30% of them are the endogenic, or the gray worm. So, here's a little 3D version of what that, that earthworm population does to the soil. Um, that just impresses me. Uh, the more I learn about earthworms, I got to listen to the earthworm speaker at uh, the University of Idaho just for a few minutes this afternoon, but. Kay wanted me to talk just a little bit about some NRCS programs that deal with soil health. Uh, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, is a, is a program that uses financial and tech, technical assistance to install or implement structures and management practices. Uh, in the case of soil health, some of the practices that, that we would look at are Residue management mulch till, uh, residue management no till, cover crops, maybe filter strips, uh, grass waterways are, are practices that are out there uh, through the USDA to help producers implement these on their on their farms. It's something if you're already doing no till, we don't pay you for doing it. It's if you're not doing it to help uh, fix that resource concern. Here's another uh, program with NRCS, the Conservation Stewardship Program. It's designed to help you maintain your present conservation activities, but to also make new conservation improvements on your operation. This is kind of been a little slam dunk to us nationwide. It's a national program that has all the same uh, enhancements uh, for the whole nation. Generally, not generally, uh, you have to have, it's a five-year contract with, with NRCS. Uh, it's about maintaining conservation and then do more conservation over the life of the contract. So it's kind of like stepping up. It requires good documentation of your farm, conservation activities, which are used to determine eligibility and ranking. Generally, there's there's more applications there are in funding, so they have to be ranked. Same thing with EQIP. Uh, I've got just a few minutes. Let me hit a couple. Back to soil health, man. I'm not a programs guy. I'm a technical guy for NRCS, but this rhizosphere has two that can have up to 2,000 times more bacteria in the rhizosphere than in the soil adjacent to it. Um, nutrient cycling and disease suppression start right there at that rhizosphere. And diversity is the key. When we look at a lot of these new farms that are coming into no-till, for example, 
they have super high bacterial populations and very little fungus or protozoa in the it's, soil health is about trying to get these in, in a balance. Here's a couple of pictures of Blue Mound from Dr. Chris Nichols, uh, ARS researcher. Uh, there's that little aggregate formant. And the green that you're seeing is the blow mallon that's been stained to show up in the slide. So it's kind of like the paint on the outside of a building. It's what's coating that aggregate, holding it together. Uh, here's a plant root. Here's that mycorrhizal fungus. The little sp spheres are the spores. Uh, but look at that. Maybe you can't see it. it's a little light in here. But those hyphostrands go out there and intercept plant nutrients and bring it back right into the plant root. It anchors itself right into a live root. Next time you pull up a plant, look at the root system and see how those little microaggregates are starting to form right at that root level. Why do they start right there? Because that's the rhizosphere. That's where that plant is leaking those sugars where those that microbiology is active. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the, to the heavy hitter now. I'm also doing a little bowl and beer session later tonight. We're going to talk more about this if, if you're interested. So, anybody have a bottle of water? I'm see what this thing looks like before water is good. When Katie asked me to present this this afternoon, my first inclination was just to put one slide up here. Direct seating 101 is basically look around your neighbors, ask them questions, and figure out how they're making it work. So I'd have more than one slide, but there's not very many here, because I would like to have as much time as possible just to have questions. What, what's on your mind? But the, the reason for the one slide is so much of what we're talking about in this whole topic is your own microclimate specific. There are some general principles that can be applied to making this adoption, but every one of you is in a different world, a different climate, different soils, different rainfall. And if we have, if we have individually needs to take these principles and apply them in our own backyard. So I'm a firm believer that we can learn an awful lot from the guy across the fence that's already been there. Again, thank you, Chuck Schmidt and North Kind Egg for sponsoring our session this afternoon. So very quickly, what's direct seeding? We'll talk about how we can take sustainable conservation and cropping system principles, how direct seeding fits with that. What are some just general approaches to implementation? And lastly, what are barriers to adoption? And then we'll try to get some time for questions. This is my simple way of summarizing what Marlon already talked about. This slide has done more to convince people or show people in one place what's going on. We're, we're trying to reverse the process of soil degradation. We are truly going from a destroying to a restoring approach. And we're doing that because we're increasing carbon dioxide in the soil, which is organic matter. And that is your factor. I said this morning we should quit talking about ourselves being farmers. We should think of ourselves as resource managers. We can take that a step further and say we are really carbon managers. Everything we do to create biomass revolves around having carbon, keeping it in the soil, improving the way that it converts sun and water into sellable biomass. That's the simplest description of what your, your job is. So what we're, what we're really doing is maybe not building up total organic matter, but we're definitely improving it in the soil surface where the primary production activities occur. The very nature of what we're doing, because we're increasing the porosity of the soil, we're increasing the ability for that water to take in water instead of run it off. We're increasing the ability for nutrient exchange to occur because it's now alive. One of the scientists that enlightened me several years ago pointed out that when we're moving from an intensive tilling system to a no-till or direct seed system, we're moving from a bacterial system of production to what? We're from scientists here. A fungicidal system of production. 
If you think about the old days, we took a plow and we turned a whole bunch of residue upside down and we buried it. And we were using bacteria to rot stuff. Okay? We don't do that anymore. We're using a system with minimum invasive tillage and we're relying on little animals in the soil and fungi, fungi, good fungi, to create the process of nutrient exchange, to create the porosity, we use the worms as our little animals to do a lot of things that we used to use tillage for. So we've totally changed the science behind how we're producing things. I said this morning we have to put equal emphasis on economic as well as environmental sustainability. So if, if at all times we're not measuring what's the impact of the <coughs> financially to do this, or the capital costs, or the entry costs, or the learning costs to do this, or the risks that I'm, I need to manage so I can make sure I can produce a crop, that has to be in there too. And I'm absolutely convinced that we are doing all these things when you fully implement a system. You don't get to a level of, I think, sustained implementation until you've been in this seven to 10 years. You just don't go out overnight and switch to it and start seeing its benefits. There will be some shocks to your system. But this set slide, and I think, really says it all. I said this morning, we are not the, by far not the leader in the world in conservation ag. But this World Congress that's been occurring in Winnipeg has been happening all over the world for the last several years. They rotated from Europe to South America to the Northern Hemisphere. But many years ago, when one of these national conferences occurred down in, in Brazil, they, they agreed on what the international principles for conservation of agriculture were. And they, there was a lot of arguments over should we call this threat seeding, no-till, zero-till. And we decided to call it what we're doing, not what we're not doing. That's why we call it direct seed. It's a system of establishing a crop with a minimum amount of invasive tillage and maximum attention to retaining residue in the soil surface. So these principles have become internationally pushed through every NRCS initiative, every worldwide conservation initiative. We've got to be directly seeded. We want permanent soil cover, we want minimum soil disturbance. We need to have multi-annual crop rotations. We have to have integrated nutrient and test management systems that are part of a system. We need to have biodiversity in the landscape. And that's where they bring in the wildlife as well as the plants. So steps, I don't know how you describe this process in steps, but this is my feeble attempt. Study your microclimate. There is no one size that fits all. You need to know your soils, you need to know your rainfall, your heat units, your elevations. That will tell you some of the options you'll have in your toolbox. Watch your neighbors. Many of you, how many of you are involved in some kind of a local peer group? Anybody here? <clears throat> it's the best way to learn. Probably 20 years ago, five of us started a local peer group where we, even though we were neighbors and we competed, we took the idea that if we came together and each of us threw an idea in, somebody else might be able to learn from that would help them better compete for me. But if I give an idea into the pot and I get four back, that's a pretty good return on investment. You have a 400% return on investment. When you expose yourself to a group where you share your best ideas, but not only your best ideas, we made a rule. We're not going to come to these meetings and brag what we did right. We're going to come to these meetings and talk about what we screwed up. And we learn more about what we did, what we did wrong, and what we can do to not have that same screw up the next year. Instead of taking five years to work through alternatives, we got five sets of ideas on how to solve that problem. That local peer group turned into 20 and then 40, we're up around 50 people that show up every three weeks all went along to learn how to do this. Those peer groups have now moved into Oregon, Washington, in addition to our, our group there in Lewiston. There's somewhere in your territory you should have access to one of these. We have people that are driving three hours to come to these meetings. That was the meeting that they would not miss. You got a free breakfast at Farm Credit. There were Farm Credit and other bankers fighting over who would buy a breakfast for this group. Now what does that tell you? They see this group as a sustainable, lower risk good customer for the future. 
So when somebody is wanting to buy you breakfast for free so that you can learn how to be a better farmer, that's sending the message of how this whole process is being used by the bankers. The other implementation thing is it's not an overnight process. We, we look back on how we converted to this process and we didn't really have a plan at the time. We just really didn't like erosion. We were trying to move to less and less tillage. So we went from the plow to the chisel plow to a disc. We always believed in, in rotations. Uh, we were some of the first in our region to grow peas and levels. My uncle served, he was one of the founders of Pea and Level Council in Moscow. We were one of the first people that grew spring canola. We grew rape way back when, but canola was a whole new thing. And we felt like this gave us a really good alternative spring crop. But there was no place to store it. Nobody had any good varieties that were adapted to our area. But we followed the principle, price of progress is willingness to appear foolish. If you do things based on what your neighbors are going to think, you would have never done any of this. But if you look at this and go, this, is, this makes sense, let's try it, let's be willing to take some risks. If you want to really make this transition, you think, well, in seven years I'd like to fully be transition. How do I transition my tillage processes to less and less tillage? How do I change my rotation system where I have oil seeds, pulses in that rotation along the grains? Some of you in low rainfall areas may think it's just not feasible. But as you study what's going on with cover crops, I'm convinced that we have overthought the issue of how much moisture is taken out of the ground by these cover crops. Years ago down in the county area out of Lewiston, we put some peas down as a cover crop. Because we had some green pea seed we couldn't use because they quit growing green peas in our area. We seeded those peas, we destroyed them after they bloomed. We destroyed the, we busted the residue down so we could get through it with the drill in the fall. And typically that area with around 13, 14 inches of rainfall would have been a wheat, spring wheat, fallow rotation. We had better wheat on that ground behind that spring pea cover crop than we would have had behind the summer fall. So it's only when programs like the cover crop initiative here are starting to educate us on how much moisture we lose in, in stubble covered uh, chem fallow versus how much moisture you lose by planting a green crop that stays green and grows in your soil and then you destroy it at blooms. We needed that information. The science community, the research community needs to give us that feedback so we don't just say, well, you can't grow a cover crop, you're going to lose all your moisture. That's not what happens. So understanding these are long-term processes that mean you've got to change not only your tilling system, but maybe you're thinking your rotation system. Not just different crops you grow for profit, but different things you put in your ground to keep live growing things, feeding those animals in the soil. The, the cost of production thing is important because you've got not only yourself to convince this is the right thing, but you've got to convince your banker that they should finance drills and, and new technology that's not... When we first started, we could buy a no-till drill for $50,000. One that was slightly used, maybe up to $100,000 was an expensive one, now you're $250,000 to $300,000 for some of this technology. So if you're afraid of making that kind of investment, look at ways to learn by accessing that through custom hiring or joint venturing with somebody else. Don't, you don't need to take all that risk up front. A lot of people in our generation got $15 to $20 an acre cost sharing programs out of Equip to go try this. They had a neighbor that would come seed your field for $20 an acre. So for zero out-of-pocket cost, you could get your crop put in by somebody who actually knew what they were doing. You could ride in the tractor, watch what they were doing, learn what was in their head, and then not have to even risk buying the equipment to see if it worked. Why would you not do that on at least 100 acres or a couple hundred acres? That, that was a great, low-risk, easy-to-way to learn how it works and not have to buy a lot of expensive equipment. It, and we'll do that with producers for up to three years. So these financial system programs, I think, are very, they're great. There's not only programs to help fund the implementation process, there's low-cost 
loans out there where you can access some of this equipment under very favorable terms. And uh, your conservation districts are a great source for that. And they've actually financed a lot of this kind of equipment. Talk this morning about comparing cost to production. The last five years, who cared? I don't think we needed to do a budget. We didn't need to have a marketing plan. All you have to do is just wake up. And if you grew anything, you made money with eight, nine dollar wheat and with seven, eight dollar corn. But those days are over. We're looking in a projection in the next three or four years where much of agriculture will be lucky to get break even. So if in fact you're working ground eight times a year and you really believe that less tillage, less labor, less equipment costs, and possibly healthier soil might be the difference between surviving, it's time to get started. Now you won't see all these benefits overnight, but I'm absolutely convinced that those numbers we showed you this morning on return on equity, you cannot get there by working ground eight to ten times a year. There's a lot of barriers out there. There's fears about taking a production hit. There are some that claim they've had a slight production hit in early transitions. I can honestly tell you that we never took a production yield hit in our transition. And there were several reasons for that. One is that we gradually transitioned our tillage from intensive to no-till. We'd already had a healthy rotation in place, so our soils were much healthier than had they been if we tried to do this when we were in a wheat pea, wheat pea, two-year rotation. It would have been a disaster. That was an accident. That was not good forward thinking. It was just we were lucky. The issues with weed control, you won't eliminate weeds, you'll have different weeds. So getting an education on what the plan for to this system, it's going to require you to rethink your whole approach. Um, a huge barrier at one time was landlords. Um, we, 20 years ago, a lot, a lot of landlords, if you told them I'd like to lease your land, and they asked you what you did, and you told them you were a direct seeder, they said, no way, I'm not going to have you screw up my ground. <coughs> because they saw a lot of people grow up in the 70s who didn't understand Green Bridge, they didn't understand the issue with the buildup of grassy weeds and, how, and we didn't understand the importance of rotations. But 20 years later, several years ago, we had a 1,700-acre lease opportunity where I'm convinced we got that lease opportunity because we were direct seeding. The landlord was 90 years old. And he looked at us and he looked at another party where we were even Stephen, and he basically said, you know, I like the idea of not losing soil out of my field. He said he could pass 15 years earlier. He thought we were the Jones brand. We were drinking Kool-Aid and that we would just be committing economic suicide. But he was a curious guy. And he watched and he studied and he said, I, I like the way you thought. We were neck and neck with the other person when we got that opportunity. A lot of people, a lot of landlords don't understand this and it's your job to convince them why it's a good deal for them. Especially if those landlords are on a crop share lease. Because they don't want to take a yield hit. And if they can see that they can spend inputs more productively on things like fertilizers that add to yield and not so much on intensive tillage, and they're going to have some healthier soil long run, which means you can pay a higher cash rent or have higher yields, that's a good selling point. The equipment is often a barrier, mostly because of the sticker shock, but don't let that be a barrier. If you really run the numbers and you look at if you're a smaller operation, it might be more effective for you to custom hire your crop seeded every year and sell all your other stuff. I know people small size where they run the numbers and cost per acre to, to rent a sprayer versus owning their own. They should not be owning their own. So we need to understand the economic principles of insourcing and outsourcing and don't try to insource something that you can hire someone else to do more cheaply than you can. Access to information is not a problem today. You young people in the room, if I ask you a question and you don't know the answer, what do you do? You hit Google. It just amazes me. People in 30 seconds can answer questions that we used to take 20, a couple years to find out answers to. So our local, our regional, our national, our international databases have more information on how to do this than we can ever read in a day. So low access to information should not be a barrier. But it's got to be locally adapted. And that's where the Direct Seed Association, through their tours, their, their newsletters, these conferences, 
that's where your opportunity is to see how we take some general principles and we bring it down to how do I apply it. Crop insurance at times has been a barrier. Uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Dave Paul, who has worked very hard to make these systems work for the Pacific Northwest. Any of you have studied the history of crop insurance, it was built for a corn and soybean producer in the Midwest on a square field, where they have a, a yield every year. It's simple. But when you bring it out here, and you, you bring in there a five-year rotation system, where you may only grow canola one time every 10 years, how do you get an APH? You may grow a pea one year. You may grow a lentil the next time in that rotation. You may grow a garbanzo bean the next time. So you have a pulse in your rotation once every five years, but it takes you how many years to get a yield? A 10-year history. It takes forever. So we have been able to work with, with RMA to develop systems where there's meaningful yields and there are meaningful histories where we can ensure these crops that are the right things to do to lower risk. But you need to understand the complexity of crop insurance and how changing your rotational system, adding new crops in your system also has a built-in push against you if you don't have a long-term history. And that can be a banker may say, I'll, I'll finance you, but I won't do it if you grow this crop because you don't have an APH. There are wires around these systems, but the best thing is getting a long-term involvement in many of these crops. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to take some, leave some time here, 10 or 15 minutes, to have just some questions and answers. You can summarize both of what both of us talked about today is this is a business and it's a way of life. But if we want our way of life, we've got to look at this as a business. It's got to be environmentally sustainable, it's got to be economically viable. We're looking at huge declines in margins in the next three to five years. And the people in this room that are looking at this system are going to be the ones that survive the challenges. The landlords, it's your job to influence them. They won't come looking for you. You need to be able to go to them with a good, articulated reason why this is a better system. So with that, I'd, I'd like to open this up and just have a general discussion. What's your most burning question? Um, do you want to moderate so we just throw it out into the room? Open for <clears throat> Yes, with that. Just about leaky root systems, which species tend to leak more than others? Uh, each plant in the community leaks different exudates. Uh, here's one, here's one for you, it's kind of wild. Buckwheat <coughs> leaks quite a bit of phosphatase and enzyme. So I don't know what phosphatase is, but the soil chemists know what phosphatase is. It's an enzyme that makes Phosphorus more available in the soil. Uh, I've heard, I can't back this up, but at other meetings, uh, farm season grasses like stand grass, corn, millets, I think they're really high in, in overall photosynthate leakage. Of course, legumes, they're all different, right? Legumes are leaking high are leaking a lot of compounds associated with their rhizobium interconnectedness. So they're leaking lots of rich nitrogen containing molecules. But I don't think you can say does turnips leak more than radish? No, I don't think we know that yet. I think the take home message is though, if you want a diverse community below ground, to make the system function, you gotta have a diverse system above ground, meaning different species. If you want a, if you want a monoculture below ground, just have a monoculture rotation then. Could I make a comment? You bet. There's one thing that I haven't heard very much from any of these talks, for example, where you have a uh, your multi-species cover crop growing. And you knock it down at, at flower, right? You knock it down. So that root system is succulent, effectively succulent when you kill it. So that root system is jam-packed with all kinds of sugars. Whereas if you have your wheat or your corn, these crops, you think about all the roots that basically become empty straws. All of that stuff is pulled.
pulled out and dumped into the grain as that plant dies down. And so I think when we're, when we're thinking about our cropping system, we can't build up the organic matter as quickly with just a wheat rotation, even though it's direct seed no till as you can with your, with your cover crop. And is it really because you're pulling that stuff out of the plant, dumping it in the grain and harvesting it, versus the green cover where you're killing it, leaving that sucker with roots into the ground? It certainly helps. One of the things that I just learned last year or so is how do we measure our soil health? And so some of these new scientists are coming up with measuring the active carbon in your soil. This is those polysaccharides, the glomalin, et cetera, that's in our soil. Just not how much straw we got in our soil, but it's a new measurement called active carbon that measures this, this, what do you want to call it? New source of carbon, this pecan pie that's feeding the microbiology world, active carbon. But just kind of segues to another issue, which is, is the old traditional soil test we've used forever really valid in a direct seed system? And there's some strong science that says, no, it's not. When you go from bacterial to fungal system, you're no longer tilling. You're putting fertilizer oftentimes placed with the seed. The old traditional algorithms that said, if you want to produce X amount of bushels, you need this many pounds of N, they don't track, but what does track? There are people that are here actually with booths that are advocating a totally different approach to soil tests. If you're going to change your system of farming to a different cropping system that uses a fungal as opposed to a bacterial system to convert nutrients, we need to move our soil testing system so it's measuring the things that will tell us how much nutrients we need to put on. And we, the workshop at Marlin and Great Ar Archuleta, yeah. they put on last winter, they showed some illustrations of different approaches to soil tests that, that are now being modified to emulate the decisions we have to make in a direct seed system. And they were totally different levels of recommendations on nutrients than the old system where you just took your soil probes and looked at your N, your P, and your K, and your S. So here's a huge area where the questions are out ahead of the science community on the answers. Is it a valid question? How many would agree it's a valid question? How many of us have made that clear to our research community? We need answers to this. So as the REACH projects out there gathering millions of pages of data, they need to be looking also at how do different soil tests work better or worse to be predictors of how much nutrients we need. Yes? How do you perceive the who that type of soil test, what are you going to do is going to be different to get the measurement What process are you going to use? If you come to my beer and bull session, we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's, check this out. You raise your hand if you've heard this. I've got, a, so, I've got an active carbon uh, analysis for my farm. Anybody? No. I have a PLFA test for my farm. Phospholipid fatty acid test? No. How about a soil health calculation from Rick Haney? No. How about a carbon nitrogen ratio in your soil? No. How about a soil food web analysis? No. See you guys? That's the five I know and I'm an infant at this. That we need to start looking at other ways to look at our soil to help us determine our benchmark condition and where we're at. See, I would have loved if I would know what I know now, I'd love to take his soil test, these five soil tests, 20 years ago on that farm and see where they're at now. Now, we have some farms in the United States of America who have take those, taken these soil tests, and it is dramatic to see where they've come from and what a, what a dead soil looks like compared to a live soil that implements those five basic principles of soil health which go right along with your, with yours. So, guys, I'm saying that there's a whole new world out there for us to start looking at how we document and we can start looking at if our soil's healthy or not. It's phenomenal. It's interesting, there's a lot of people out here right now that are evaluating how good a farmer we are by how accurate our soil tests are, 
and how well we have adopted nutrient management systems that are tied to that. And while these people don't even have a real soil test. And if you have them two different kinds of soil tests and said, here's one from a conventional system, here's one that's tailored to a direct seed cropping system, they wouldn't even know how to compare the difference in the two. And how, how would they evaluate your, your nutrient management system as being completely uh, in compliance with what the soil recommendations were? So I'm not blaming our evaluators. They said, we don't know. The people evaluating us don't know. The research community does not have good answers to these questions. But if we're going to move forward, I think we have to have this. And we certainly don't want to be wasting nutrients if we don't need to. There are people that advocate that under some of our systems we can cut 20 to 30 percent in core nutrients. Um, I know a lot of people that are afraid to do that. They don't like to get the yield yet. But if in fact we can do that and we can invest those savings in something else, um, great. How many of you in this room are just thinking about going to direct seeding and are, are not already doing it? Cool. Well, I wish you luck in that. <laughs> yes, question that. Paul, oh, I just want to make a comment again for those that are thinking about starting. If you're from Idaho, uh, we talk about different financial programs. And I have a program with the Federal Water Conservation Commission. So that's 2.5% money, seven year terms for that equipment to transitioning over for the part of the conservation plan. Uh, I know the Spokane Conservation District does. You have to just be from Idaho? Well, our program does, the Spokane Conservation District is step one. Questions? In the summer pilots, did you actually leaked off due to transpiration? <laughs> then they've compared how much water you had and then how much was still there after the cover crop system. And Marlin can speak to this, but they've actually shown situations where there was more water left after the cover crop than there was with the chem <laughs> So you, you can't say the argument is we're going to lose all this precious moisture, if that's true. And second of all, the health of that soil, because it had something growing in it all those summer months, is it's much more resilient. You've built some additional organic matter, and you have fed those microorganisms all summer long that traditionally go for years, starve it. That's the problem that, that I see in, in our low elevations where we think we need to have this chem foul in our rotation. We just quit feeding all the little animals that we rely on for nutrient exchange for a whole year. Yeah. Well, we've done some of that to cover crop and some research on the local farms. I mean, it when we established after the cover crop or some. It, it just didn't work. Those seeds of moisture don't have to depleted in the backyard. Um, well, that traditional system of workforce. I don't think what they've been doing with cover crop from the experience they're doing in the Midwest or directly correlate to what we're doing in our dry area. You talked about, you know, in this area last year, you talked about you know, what, what's green and everything and stuff growing in your area. But when I look at our dry area, we almost have a natural summer fallow system in July and August because it's really green, like a pine tree, brush skeleton weed. Russian thistle and kosher. And sometimes even no scrub. But I'm not saying cover crop won't work, but we have to work with the system that they talk about and, and find a different scheme to get them so you, crops working. So you know one of the things that, that a lot of guys throughout the nation are working on is maybe we can't grow a cover crop full season, but maybe we can grow a cover crop for eight weeks. Maybe we're going to lose water through evaporation. But, but what we're saying, after, say again? We didn't have much vegetation after eight So you know what? That sounds like me a couple of years ago. Because everything as a production agronomist I, I, I was ever taught was about what I see above ground. We never talked about the rise of spirit. We never talked about increasing the microbiology and evaluating that through the PLFA test. All we ever talked about was clipping and weighing. Was it a success or not? But you know what? The microbes aren't too worried about that above ground biomass. That's just going as residue as this, as the residue. What's happening is increasing that active carbon below the soil. 
Hmm. Yeah, that freaks me out, man. I <coughs> spent a lot of years and a lot of money at school and was never taught that. All I was taught was to clip. So the guys that are making this work are keeping a live plant, feeding that microbiology biology as much as possible when technically feasible. So I'm working with a few guys scattered around the state, and maybe we're only growing that for six or eight weeks. But that six or eight weeks of a diverse mix that has never been on that farm before that's feeding that microbiology and helping to improve that habitat, that soil structure. I think what Marlon is pointing to is just reinforcing the point we've made several times. <clears throat> this is a systems approach, and when it comes to cover crops, our microclimate's different than South Dakota. We don't get 10 inches of rain during the summer. So I think Rutt Center summed up better than anybody when we were talking last night to the guy that's going to be presenting on the cover crops tomorrow. We need to be an opportunist. We need to decide if it's a good concept. We need to have the perfect conditions to do it. This summer we wanted to do it. We waited, we waited, we didn't get rain. We gave up on the idea, and then we got three inches of rain late summer through the fall. It would have been a perfect year in hindsight to have tried some fall cover crops. If we would have had enough window, they would have gone up and done a great job. But we got pushed beyond the window where we could get it in. But would I try it again? Absolutely. And I think we have to say, it's a concept where we're only going to utilize it if we're ready, we have a plan, we have the seed, we have maybe some funding from NRCS, we can get Trey to try a little harder to get us some funding. And if you're ready and you get the window, you go. I, I had the opportunity to spend some time in Australia a few years ago. And these guys, they have a huge planting window. They don't go to a calendar and say, it's April 1st, it's time to plant. They run around with this big, long, four-foot probe in their pickups. And the day comes that they can shove that in the ground, they go see. And it might be Christmas Eve. I was on a farm that went out on Christmas Eve and planted the cow peas, because that was the day when there was enough moisture to get a drill to put something in the ground. And while I was there, they were harvesting a fantastic crop. And it was because they're opportunists. I think that's the message here, is that we have to understand the system. We have to be ready grab the opportunity, but not just like a robot, go do it because it makes sense and not use some common sense. Yes? Um, I kind of like to tap those three conversations together because I think you raised some good points. We, we farm here in four, seven hills, and I think we got a lot of years to do this five, six, seven inches, and we're very hot to go with the summer power rotation. And I think what you said makes sense is what nature has actually done is it's created a summer power rotation all the same thing goes on in the summer and it weighs back up like this well and grows in the wet season. So how would you go about implementing some type of cover crop in that environment? When would you put it down? How would you control that? How would you kill it when it comes to that? Because I think we're all in the on the soil of this, but how do I do that with your own small amounts? And this is where we've got to come together with partnerships and help figure this out for our community. Because every community in the United States has the same question. The deep south says, We're, we, we have too much humidity and too much moisture. But one of the things that some of the guys are doing is they're, well, some of them evolved uh, in a wheat fallow system. Now they went continuous cropping. And they say, hey, let's take a step back 10 years ago. Maybe we can go we can get some of these cover crops going in place of a fallow, in place of our fallow system, and bring that fallow system back, because they now they're continuous cropping. It's like, holy mackerel, to try to bring this in. Some of these guys' as goals throughout the U.S. that I talked to in some of these big meetings are talking about how to get off the fertilizer IV. What if I told you you couldn't put no fertilizer on the ground? How would you do that? some type of legume. We call that bio, a biological primer. You would do that with a biological primer, right? You're priming the biological system. You're getting it all woke up and getting a big, nice community, a diverse community going. Yeah, that's how you do this. So maybe, maybe some of these guys take 20% of their acreage out and put in a full season cover crop. 
try to learn how to do this system. Anyway, that's wild, but we certainly need we certainly need all the community here to help us figure this out a little bit. But I don't believe that I don't believe that this is the last step we can go if we follow no kill. I just in my heart I don't believe it. I think there's more that we can do. Maybe we plant some of these covered crops right with our can we just keep our schedule on track? We are, our time's up, but see, we'll be around here, so if you want to have more questions, we can talk to you in a moment. Let's uh, thank again North Pine Supply for sponsoring this session and we'll move on to the next session. Thank you.